Welcome everyone, happy Wednesday. Uh, thank you for joining us for week 12, which is actually our 13th episode of Hope Heart and the Human Spirit, because we had a bonus episode uh, for uh, Pride and Black Lives Matter. Um, so um, uh, that's just a little known fact uh, that uh, we like to keep you on your toes here at Hummingbird Humanity. Uh, so thank you all, thank you for joining us today, for being part of, of the series and being part of this conversation. If you're new here and this is your first time with us, uh, just a, a bit about Hummingbird Humanity. Uh, I, I started this um, organization uh, to champion human-centered workplace cultures. Uh, I have, uh, I believe that we've, we've somewhere along the way, or maybe we never had it, but we've lost the humanity in our workplaces. And I really want to spark question and conversation and dialogue and discussion and reflection on how do we um, take care of the heart and soul of our companies? How do we make sure that we start from from thinking people first in our work. Uh, so that's what human, Hummingbird Humanity is all about. And that's really what this series is about, is uh, starting from the stories of, the, of these amazing humans who do work in the world to make the world a better place, but they're also, they're also humans just like everyone else. Um, and let's we try to start from their stories and hearing about their lived experiences, and then also to learn from them along the way from the work that they do and how they have brought their humanity with them into their, their own work. Uh, so I'm delighted today. Um, so again, thank you for being here. Welcome. Glad to have you. And I'm delighted today to be joined by Ray Arada, who is a, a founder with of the Better Man Conference. And that's actually where we met. We met at a Better Man Conference in this past fall at Moody's Corporation. Um, and uh, and have become friends since then. He gave me a, book, a signed book of his, a uh, signed copy of his book that day, which was was which is still on my bookshelf over there. Um, and you know those moments where we connect with others who are passionate about this work is so exciting. And I'm grateful to be part of Ray's community, um, and really glad that he's here with us. Um, and one other thing I'll just I'll mention that I love about Ray's work. One of the conversations that I have very often in the work that I do as a diversity, equity, and inclusion practitioner primarily is we need more men to be part of this conversation, particularly straight, cisgender, white men, but we can also just say men, because um, when I'm in rooms that I'm hosting diversity and inclusion events, I find that the room is primarily people of color, women, and then members of the LGBTQ plus community. Not to discount others who have, have passions, people with disabilities, for example, or um, people of, of generations where they feel like they're outside of the group. But those, though, that's usually what it's made up of is, is those, those groups that I, I have been highly marginalized and stigmatized and are really saying, like the people in those groups say, we got to be in the room. What we need, though, is we need men in that room because they're, the, they're often the decision makers, which is something we're working to change um, to have, have representation at those decision tables. Uh, and I think Ray is really saying and is asking that question of how do we get men in the room and what does that look like and, and how do we start to change the paradigms for men so they feel comfortable and safe in those rooms and they can then be part of the conversation. Because I found a lot of them actually want to be part of the conversation too. So. I'm gonna to get too far into all the things I wanna talk about. So as you can tell, I'm excited that Ray is here. Um, Ray, welcome. Um, I'll, I, I'm so glad that you said yes to the conversation today. I'll let you share a few you know, opening words, comments, whatever you'd like to share. I'm sure I've missed a bunch of things that we should know about you. Thank you, Brian. And it's, a great, it's great to be here. I mean, there's so much stuff I could say, but um, in listening to you um, talk about um, the need for white cisgendered uh, straight men to, to get in the room. One of my goals is to get all men and, and humans into their hearts. So that is what really uh, showed up and popped up in my mind when, when you were saying that. And we'll get to all the fun stuff as, as we um, have our conversation today. But I just, that, that's what I feel compelled to say. And let, let's go. So what do you got for me? What do you, what do you want to know? <laughs> Love it. I will. I have so many questions as we can already yeah. tell. Um, but let, before we talk about the work you do, which is where I went first, because I'm, I'm so excited about the work. You know, you and well, tell us about you. How did you get to where you are today? Did you start on purpose work? Did you start it in another path? What what prompted you to get here? Tell us about that story. So I can I, I have the abridged version um, uh, is that in 1999, um, I experienced uh, a one-two punch wake-up call on, in my personal life and business life. 
whereby uh, the mother of my three children um, at one o'clock in the morning, two months into our new house, I got the, I don't love you anymore speech. Yikes. And then six weeks later, I uh, had a, one of my business partners, I had two business partners in the financial services arena. He left and went to another firm and he went from fen, fen, friend to foe. So I had a betrayal and a crack in the foundational picture of mommy, daddy with three kids. And I was ill-equipped to emotionally deal with all this, not knowing that um, I had something to do with it. And uh, I was invited by my manager, a woke man in the financial services industry of all industries, invited me to do a men's weekend. Uh, this weekend, what I can now say uh, was a, an initiation into healthy manhood or a journey to the heart, if you will. And it had me examine um, how the pained little boy in me was running the show and how this outdated model of what it meant to be a man helped me see not only was it not serving anybody around me, but it wasn't serving me either. And so with that weekend, I launched into attending a men's group regularly. I started staffing these weekends. And that was when people would come up to me, uh, say, Ray, remember when we talked and you said, and I'd say, no, what did I say? <laughs> and this, this was happening frequently. So more cups of coffee with men who were attracted to who I was becoming as a whole hearted centered man. And women started saying, hey, could you talk to this guy? And so I kept doing these weekends, became a leader. Fast forward, here I am 20 years later. The work evolved into prison work, into me writing the book. And in 2013, I was introduced to a, a diversity and inclusion consultant who, uh, she was a woman, and she said, Ray, I'm really intrigued with what you're doing. You know, what would you do with a room full of, of women leaders? Um, having them want more. And I'm like, I'm not so sure. So I went back to my book, Wake Up, Man Up, Step Up. And I, I came up with this whole workshop thing. And she said, you know what? The women aren't ready to hear from you yet. You need to go talk to the men, right? You look like them. You sound like them. Why don't you go to a women's leadership conference and listen? So I went to Watermarks, one of their events. And basically, first event, I'm the only guy there. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. All those stories my mom told me about being second born in an Italian family, that my uncle, my godfather, he got all the rights and privileges and she didn't. Then I looked a little closer to home and my wife, who's the oldest of seven kids, the youngest brother is running the real estate business. And then I thought about my daughter who was gonna be graduating from Duke with a degree in computer science. So that was a man in the mirror moment number two, where I said, am I going to stay in this man church and just do these men's weekends? Or am I going to walk across the metaphorical street and connect to leaders uh, and have leaders who have male leaders who have position, power, and privilege to use that to create shift in cultures that embarked me on my journey. Uh, and after, you know, standing in front of groups full of women, talking to them about how to engage men, healthy and patience, uh, got the best of me and I came up with the idea of doing a conference that focused on the engagement of men as allies and partners, which is the Better Man Conference. So I reached out to a couple of woke corporate people throughout the idea um, and I said, well, I wanna bring forth healthy masculinity and they're like, uh, what do you mean by that? <laughs> when, and here we are. <laughs> so that's the abridged version. There's offshoots, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And of course, there's so many questions I have, but I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to just the reality of the setting we're in. I know before the call, we were yeah. talking about your, you're in your office, but it looks like a bedroom right now. Will you tell yeah. all the viewers why that is? <laughs> yeah. So um, I have three adult children and uh, uh, because of COVID, um, two of the three moved back. And what's been interesting is you hear a lot about parents with younger children zoom classes all that kind of stuff and i don't hear that many parents with older children who have young opinionated <laughs> growing in, uh, adults sitting in the question of who am i whilst their parents 
or step parents are in the house. And so my daughter, Emma, who uh, uh, came back, she, she's she been living here. Now I'm happy to say, and they know this, uh, they're leaving. <laughs> it's time. So my son's leaving Sunday and my daughter's leaving in a couple of weeks, but they've come back and they actually healed. They did some real good work. We all did some work. Thank God we had the technology of heart uh, in the house because all of us, we all got our buttons pressed and we had the wherewithal and the heart to stay in it and grow and take responsibility. So it's a time that we will never, ever, ever forget that much I'm sure of. I'm curious, just knowing what's important to you before we go to the work in the book, it sounds like you're close to your family. Is that, is that part of like what this journey has given you as a person is the relationships in your personal life in a different way? Yeah. Uh, when I, uh, woke up per se, and I started to do my own healing, um, it introduced me to vulnerability, um, the power and strength of vulnerability, authenticity, emotional literacy. And what I've learned over the years is as I do the work, so do uh, the others around me. So uh, right now my kids are with their mother over in Tiburon. And every, even though we're divorced, uh, we do holidays together. We all get along. We're a, a new, more condensed, you know, reformed kind of family. So relationships for me are, are very, very, very important. So yeah, that's a long winded answer to your question. Oh, I, I can, I, if you want to battle about long-winded answers, let's game on because I can talk. Um, well, uh, well, tell us, so actually, I don't think I knew this part of the story and, and I may have not heard it correctly. Did the book come before the conference? Yes, the book came before the conference because when I wrote the book, I was, the constituency that I was trying to reach was men in pain or uh, about to be in pain and looking for uh, a way to be better in their relationships, better in their community, better in their companies, right? And so when I wrote that book, that it just, it was one of those things where it needed to come out. So when I wrote that book, I, it helped me order everything. So now my next book, which I'm happy to say, uh, I have a literary agent, so that's a whole new ball game and they're gonna be putting it in front of uh, a variety of publishing houses. The working title might be the Allies Manifesto, but once again, um, I've taken uh, everything that I've learned to reach men that are sitting in the question of what do I do, what do I say, not say, not do. Organizations, what do I, how, what do I, how do I deal with the men? And everyone else who belongs to a marginalized group that wants to understand, support, and be supported by these kind of guys. So um, I was working on some of that this morning. So here we go again. That's awesome. Well, congrats on the literary a literary agent. I'm I'm writing my new book, so I'm this is a whole new land. My my new book, my first book. Um, I sometimes I, I I'm like, should I say my first book? Because it may be the only book that ever happens. Because it's a it is a it's a quite the process an exercise, and you're going to do a second one. Oh my goodness, that's that's an understatement. <laughs> I, I didn't realize how much I was going to learn about myself in the process of writing the book. Um, it's, it's a great experience, though. Um, I, I, I'm curious, uh, you know, of course, I live in corporate America um, for my career. I, this, I, I'm, I'm fortunate to be doing work outside of corporate America now, but, I'm at, but with corporate America as a consultant. And uh, but when I was in those, you know, in those four walls and I was I was um, assessing the landscape and I learned about the Better Man Conference, I'll, I'll admit, like, my first reaction was like, I'm not sure that fits. Um, and I know this is a conversation you've had with Jennifer Brown and I've had with Jennifer Brown. Brown. I, I also get that men need to be part of the work. Um, and I also know that, and you have mentioned this earlier, that even though it is the Better Man Conference, everyone's welcome. And I know you know, even those who live outside the gender binary are welcome, right? So it's a welcoming to everyone. Um, but I'm curious, how have you found practitioners like me or companies or you know corporations, how are people, how do people react to this conversation of there's a conference for men? A year ago or now or four years ago, I can answer that, you know, I, I can answer it now it's like, uh, they're they get it 
<laughs> they totally get it. Um, I, I'm pounding the drum a lot less that, uh, that putting attention and intention on men is key. It's like what everybody already knows is that the vast majority of leadership positions are held by men, right? We know that. So why not go straight at them? Why not uh, leverage the underutilized and overrepresented majority, men, to be allies, right? And so, you know, combating sexism and homophobia is one thing. It also applies to racism. So that, that for us, the tactic hasn't changed that much. Get these guys into their hearts, help them understand that privilege is not a bad thing, uh, that it's something that one can use for the sake of other humans, right? And let's all do this together. So yeah, so right now, more and more companies, you know, companies like Roche and Genentech and Intel and Oracle and Cisco and Moody's, they're all, committed they're all committed to doing this and they recognize that they've got a ways to go yeah again i could be long-winded but i'm going to stop <laughs> it's okay um uh we well and you've you've actually had some of those companies host the better man conference right so That's i know moody's correct. did and unilever uh where's some of the uh, other bank of the west owned by bnp paribus um they've been a host in the past yeah I, that's that's great. Well, and I know we 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 got close to getting Tapestry to do it, and unfortunately, it didn't work out. Um, but I but I remember the, the aha that I had because I had been curating events, creating events, and in, in our space uh, for that were Champion University, and I was I'd been paying attention to who showed up in the room, um, and I shared that group earlier, right? That list, and then what I realized was men were missing um if there were men in the room typically they were gay men i happen to yeah. know them. um but there were men there we were missing the the straight men and uh and then i'm like wait ray has this way that we can maybe get some of them in the room and yeah. um and i'm like wait we should do this and um and unfortunately it didn't work out but i still love the idea is that what you're seeing is like are, are those like light bulbs going on for, for yeah others? and you know my little mantra uh is is going first if I go, so can they. And so if I use my cisgenderedness, my whiteness, my Italian American, if I put it all out there and I go first, I've known this from my men's work, 15,000 hours worth of work, that if I, if I go and I show, then they can and they will, right? And so, and so even when you know the COO of Moody's, him and I had a, a coaching call before he went on and he said, so what should I do? And I said, be real, admit your, your screw ups, own that you made some mistakes, resolve to do better, tell truth. And I get an email from him three days before the conference. And he's like, you won't believe this story I have, uh, but I'm not going to tell you until we get to the conference. So you were there. He, he stood up and, you know, he told the story. And I remember him saying my, when my wife said, you're just like the rest of them referring to a lot of those guys that need a little work that that you could hear a pin drop in the room but what he may not have realized in the moment but was that his vulnerability his humanness made it possible for all the other men in the room to potentially go there and even though my original idea for the better man conference was for men it's not just for men it's for men and women we've we've had breakouts non-binary breakouts and we recognize that no matter how you represent it or who you are in a company, there's going to be those straight men. So why not figure out together how we can all move forward? So we've, we've maintained that intention uh, to be inclusive. Otherwise, we'd be hypocrites. <laughs> yes, yes, I agree. Well, I, I used to... I, I, um... Some, you know, some people will know, many may, may know that I, I've played with Gotham Volleyball, which is, which is the LGBTQ plus gay, you know, league and uh, volleyball league in New York City, um, or we typically just call it the Gay Volleyball League. And one thing that, um, that I make sure that we say, though, is everyone's welcome. Like, it may be the Gay Volleyball League, but if you want to play volleyball, it doesn't matter who you are, come join us. And there are people that are straight in the league, there are men and there are women, 
There are people who are you know, from, you know, from the transgender community, which is beautiful, um, you know, and, and others, you know, I, I'm sure that we have, we cover the, the whole span to count of diversity. To your point, it, the whole point is to create a safe space for people who need a place to play volleyball, um, and uh, and that that uh, we would be hypocritical if we weren't welcoming everyone. So, I you know I love these organizations that we start from a center point place of how do we create a space for this community, but everyone's in, invited in those walls. And, and, and eventually, one of the end games is how can each of us individually create a safe space for the human being that is sitting across from us and some of the thing, one thing that you and i did not talk about <clears throat> that is that in in the mankind project where i'm a, a co-leader i've all, i often get asked to be a mentor for other men on the path to becoming a leader <clears throat> and three of my four mentors are gay and i was curious like why did you choose me and and the, the answers were pretty similar in that they chose me because I represent that alpha, aggressive, straight male that they need to do their work around so they can feel more safe, so they can be more in their power, so they could be a man according to them. So it's, it was, it's been an amazing journey for me to also get the, you know, the blessing that I'm safe but also to help me understand that masculinity has many different shades. Mm. And that one of our episodes that we're gonna be doing on, on our Getting Real series is the shades of masculinity. What does that mean for you know, uh, a black indigenous man of color or a brown man, a gay man, a man in transition, whatever the case may be. So I'm excited about that. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's interesting you share that because, because that's actually the space of getting comfortable comfortable with, I'll use the term alpha male, has been part of my own journey. You know, growing up as a, uh, not knowing that I was gay, but knowing that I felt different, that I didn't feel like I fit with those alpha men um, or those jocks or, you know, there's different ways that those groups come to life. And, and I, what I've learned as an adult, I've made friends with some of those men. I mean, one of my dear friends is a secret service agent. Uh, and, you know, you, he, well, it's funny because I don't think he's actually all that alpha, but I think that's because I know him as a human. Um, he's just a, he's just another guy, right? He has a wife and kids and he's just trying to figure out life like the rest of us. Um, but he's also accepted me for me and we are friends. And every time he's in my city for work, he says, let's get together for dinner. And he treats me no different than anyone else. And I've had people like him in my life who've helped me break down the way that I saw how I didn't fit with the alpha male. And I now see them as just another person. Um, but it, it was work. It took some time. Well, a little secret. There's a big part of me that never felt like I fit with them. So mm -hmm. I, as we talked earlier, I was covering my emotionality, my sensitive side. I've often felt more comfortable with people uh, that belong to the LGBTQIA community and people of color, because I could be all of me. <laughs> I could be flamboyant, I could be soft, I could be tender, and I didn't get chastised for it. You know, and now at this stage in life, I'm just who I am all the friggin' time, and now I don't take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> and some of those alpha guys who I ride my bike with, you know, pop their mouth off. It tells me more about them than it does me, so. Well, the, the confidence that can, can come with age uh, which I which I completely get. I'm, I'm I now host a live series on a weekly basis where I talk about my stuff every week, right? So um, you know that this would not have happened ten years ago. I didn't have that yet, and that's you know we get there when we get there. Uh, you know, one of the things that I'm just I'm reflecting on is you and I are both using all of these words um, at, around different communities and and different ways that we define different groups, and also we, you know you and I both share this, we go back to the fact that we're all human as well. Um, but how did you get, like, I know that for me, it's been a journey and I'm still learning. Actually, one of the things that I'm going to check on afterwards is I, I think we have both used the word cisgendered with an ED. And I think it's actually without the ED. I think it's just its gender. So I need to check to make sure that we're, that we're both using the right word. Um, so I'll double check that. But you know, I'm always realizing, like, I have to pay attention to these words, and I have to learn how do I make sure I use words that are respectful for different communities um, and for how they define themselves. And how did you learn the language, though, of this of these conversations? And how are you helping others get comfortable with it? Because that's part of this work. Yeah. So uh, trial and error. 
uh, in part. Uh, two, surrounding myself with people that know more than me. So uh, Chris Bell, one of my partners, uh, single mother who identifies as queer. I've known her for many years. My first company was a company called Gender Allies. And it was myself and two gay women. Uh, one of them was a woman of color. So, I mean, school was in session, learning curve like this to begin with. Now, with that said, um, in terms of, for your listeners and for just in terms of how, how does one proceed along this, we, I always say we have to remember our humanness. Why do I say that? Because I'm going to screw up. I'm going to make a mistake. So if I, are, if I can acknowledge my humanness and know I'm going to make a mistake, I'm not going to walk on eggshells. Am I going to have the intention to uh, work on my own awareness and language so as to minimize its impact on other people? Absolutely. Right? But what happens if I goof, if there's an oops or an ouch? I'm going to clean it up and I'm going to resolve to do better. So, so it's a, it's a, it can be a slippery slope. So when anybody who's choosing to step on the path of becoming an ally, uh, even that, like I don't call myself an ally. I'm forever an ally in training. That keeps me honest, keeps me learning, right? And so that would be my answer to, you know, how I learn, how I'm learning, right? And even like when you said cisgendered, I'm like, okay, I didn't know that. Did I, did I go down the shame spiral and chastise myself? No, that's not going to do anybody any good, you know, so. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and you're right. Like it, it is, uh, it is being okay with the fact that it's not possible for us to, to have all the information and all the answers and all the understanding. If we can be on, if we can be open to learning, um, and, uh, along the way, uh, there, there's, a. Uh, a weekly, I've, there's my, my colleague, Laurie Musinski and I uh, started a series, uh, a learning circle where we're, we are getting together with, uh, with two cohorts right now. We're going through the book, White Fragility together. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> one of the lessons that um, our learnings, I think that Laurie shared in the, the first session is this concept of calling in, that we're in the room together and we're gonna help each other learn. Um, and, and actually one of, you know, this happened on a, on a session earlier this week where someone who is, is a, this, these groups are primarily white um, individuals who are understanding whiteness in, in a different way. And someone referred to everyone who has felt like outsiders. And Laurie said, I just wanna, I'm gonna have a, a call in moment here of when we use the word outsider, we're centering whiteness as the, as the right way and everything else is not. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and that, you know, similar to what you just said, the, the individual who, uh, who had used the word said, you know, thank you so much. Like it helped, it helps her learn and show up differently the next time. Didn't go down the shame spiral. So it's, but that's not easy to do. It, I mean, that takes some like practice. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Take practice. One, and with that practice, that requires courage. Mm -hmm. The courage to be uncomfortable occasionally. That's just part of the work. So if you've got that, keep going. <laughs> yes, and, and keep going, and then keep going, and keep going. Uh, now, I, I had a chance to go through, uh, you know, to, to join the conference in, in October, and actually, make sure I give credit to, I got to be there because of, of Jennifer Brown Consulting, uh, and, and uh, our, our, our mutual friend, Robert Bevan, um, who, uh, who said, Brian, you should be in this room, and you, you should have this experience, so they, they helped get me in the room. Um, you know, I recall that you had a framework that you took the, the people through during the course of that day. Um, and, you know, can you share that with us about how you're approaching the framework and the learning through the Better Man Conference? Absolutely. So the, the framework, uh, uh, how I do my personal work, how I often frame up uh, keynotes uh, is what we call the allies journey. And the and think of the this I'm gonna I'm gonna state the four steps of the Allies journey as contextual, and literal. So the first step is acknowledge that I have bias and privilege. Now inherent in that first step has us as men look at man box behaviors and outdated norms of masculinity because they're often hidden, right? So let's shine the light on that as well. 
not just bias, not just privilege. Step two, take responsibility for the impact of my bias and privilege and man box behaviors. And when necessary, clean it up. That opens up the door for an exploration of intention versus impact, right? Step three, listen with empathy and compassion. This is key. This is where diversity stories, and everyone has one. I love that phrase that Jennifer uh, helped me see. Um, that, and it's also where men and women make the journey from the head to the heart. And that opens up the door. And I was just writing in my, my uh, book chapter this morning uh, around what are, what are things companies can do to uh, support men to talk, act, and think like a man. And one of them is be willing to do a, a qualitative gender assessment uh, by asking women in your company, what's it like? What's going on for you? With the intention to, to without shame or blame, help men see what's happening all around them, right? Step four is, and all these steps are iterative, by the way, um, is commit to new practices and behaviors. Now, the fifth step is lather, rinse, repeat, but I don't need to say that because I, you're going to keep doing these steps over and over again. So what we did in the Better Man Conference is we inserted an experiential exercise that basically gave people an experience for that step and then took them through. And so that's, that's, uh, that's how, we do, how we do it. You stole my next question, Ray, which was, I, I'm like, as I'm hearing these, my guess is it's a bit like peeling an onion, that yes. as you go through a journey, then you realize I have another journey to go through. And, and I mean, I've experienced it myself of, you know, the, the first time that I really came to understand that I have bias, like, because yeah. I don't want to believe that, but actually it's really important that I understand that I have bias um, because then I can then choose to act differently. Uh, but then getting to the place where like, okay, well now I understand that racism is also part of who I am and that I will have racist aspects to how I see the world. And that I can also be intentional about that. That is, that was, but I don't think I could have gotten to that conversation if I hadn't gotten through the bias conversation first. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that there's probably another phase that I, that I'm yet to uncover and I, I, I will, I'll get there someday when I'm ready. Uh, but it's, but it is an ongoing journey. Yeah. Robin D'Angelo's book and her term white fragility, uh, the way I hold white fragility is yeah. Okay. It's a condition. It's, it's a reality out there, but how do you want to be, you know, when I listen to our friends of color, they're saying, you know, I get that you've got this white fragility but act, move on, be courageous. We've been living with the horrors for generations, right? So join us, get past your fragility, understand your fragility, grow from your fragility and join us. So it's, 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 there's a lot. And, and um, the, the trick is how, how can, you know, that the, those messages that come from our friends of color, um, not put the white people into shame and blame and defensiveness. All of this is muscle building. So the, the allies journey, which we initially created for men, we found uh, also applied to allyship in general, which we found applies to the current Black Lives Matter uprising. So it, 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 the, the context is still there and the, the nuances um, are, are different, but it still applies. Yeah. Are there, would you, with the allies journey, um, are there any of those steps that you have found are more are more challenging than other steps for, for people to go through? And how do you get them through the, that, that over that hurdle? Well, um, first of all, what I've found, and this is an indirect answer to a question you haven't asked, is that most companies are at step one. Mm. Most human beings are at step one. Um, now, not mainstream, you know, DNI practitioners, people like ourselves, but a lot of people um, are at that step one. And so, probably one of the most difficult steps is the intention versus impact nuance that falls under take responsibility. That's 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 a that's a difficult one to do. You know, 
I love everything related to the heart. So I want to skip step three <laughs> as often as possible and to, to help people be human. And what I've learned and what I teach is this work and of being an ally requires a partnership of the head and the heart, conscious head, conscious heart. So conscious head is where you need to start or get to. I mean, you might be a heart-centered guy like me, but you got to go to your level of awareness and understand bias, you know, bust the bias, interrupt the bias, rewrite the bias, whatever you need to do so that you stay awake here in your head, right? So it's, I mean, in one respect, all the steps are difficult, but I would say, you know, it's, it's you know, that step one and two is where most people are, and that's where most of the work needs to happen. I find that by the time we get to step three, we're all human. We just need to be given permission to, to, to be so. Yeah, you, you just reminded me of um, a conversation we had in the, 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 the learning circle session earlier this week um, around, actually it was last week, um, where we, what, what, was, what was happening, the, the chapters that we had read and, and White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo before that session they made us all really uncomfortable because we're all facing this stuff about ourselves um, yeah. as white, white people and what it means for us. And uh, one of the members uh, in the group who has, uh, he's, he's currently in an intentional listening phase. He's, as a professional, he said, I just learned how to listen better. And so he was just watching the, what was happening around the group. And he said, I'm just gonna just step in here because what I see is we've, we've skipped from discomfort to solving an action. And we skip the like, how do we like process this and how do we sit with it and how do we understand it? And how do we accept it? Yes, we should get to action, but you know, it's a group that is primarily executives and leaders and people that have been taught. We need to go forth and solve something and make it happen. And that's, that's, a, that's not a bad instinct, but in this conversation, it, it's actually not gonna serve us well because we're gonna miss the point. Um, and I love that he brought us, brought us back to like, we gotta process it first before we can even get to how can we be part of the solution? What does that look like? Was the group mainly men? Actually, these groups are primarily women, interestingly enough. Um, yeah, it's um, actually, as, as you would expect, the groups are primarily women and gay men. Um, yep. we, we do have, um, we intentionally invited a few straight men, um, straight white men to be part of the group because we wanted that and they've been great contributors. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, I think it's, it's mostly what, I, what we really attribute to is less about the gender dynamic and more about what it means to be an executive in corporate America and what's expected of us. Um, and, and how we're taught to assimilate to that. Well, I, I even in our, in, the reason why I asked the question is it reminded me of the work I've done on my own journey and how I learned a long time ago that us guys tend to want to fix yeah. and us guys weren't taught to process right now in the in a traditional gender binary construct in it, it you, one can make those assumptions however or and inside companies if you if you look look at it through the optics of uh what women have had to do in order to survive and thrive they've uh, overinflated their masculine attributes and assimilated right so there's a part of me that you know, wants to invite more men to adapt and incorporate their feminine attributes and to somehow let women know, you know what, those, those feminine attributes that, that you didn't think served, we need them. <laughs> so, so that's why I asked that question because going to action, because the story I was making up was always oh, a bunch of guys. Let's, let's go straight to solution. And I was wrong. Yeah. Well, and, and, uh, it what what is what i think is um i'll say right about the assessment is no the people in that room weren't primarily men but the people in that room have been have grown up in a world designed by men and have exactly. adjusted to corporate america designed by men so that's how they show up in the room exactly um, and because they were like no we have to put all that other stuff away um i mean i think that's why like I, you know, you and I share this, um, you know, this passion for like, for, for the heart and soul. Like I, the, the book I'm writing, um, hopefully <laughs> will come, will, will come out next year. Um, as we were talking about before, or maybe it was early in the conversation, the live conversation, it's not easy. Um, but it is about like, how do we get back to heart and soul? 
um, because I think we've lost a lot of what we need to bring into the, our four walls of corporate, any corporation, because we're, we're leaving heart and soul out of it. And we're all trying to be these action oriented, solution oriented individuals, which is good. I, you know, I don't want to discount that, but, but we're missing part of the conversation of there are people that work there, there are humans that work there. And we, and all the products and services are all bought by humans too. Uh, and if we don't think about humanity, I, I just, I worry that we're missing something. I call it the new technology and I have a, a thriving coaching practice and pretty much all my conversations of late have been just this. I, I was talking to a CEO yesterday. I'm like, instead of focusing on the success of your company, why not pay attention to what's going on right in front of you through mm -hmm. the lens of humanness? People are struggling. You're struggling hit pause, <laughs> uh, acknowledge, process, slow down, connect, right? It, it's this kind of foundational work that needs to happen. I mean, in my own opinion is that COVID and the, the uprisings as a result of George Floyd's murder um, have basically shown the spotlight on uh, the futility of all the other stuff that we've been doing. And it's demanding, demanding that we be human because that's the only thing that's going to get us through this. So part of me is like, <laughs> bring it on, <laughs> bring it on. Let's, we, we need to be, it's the only way we're going to get out of this together. Yeah. That's my two cents. Yeah. Well, and, and I will, I'll add my two cents, which and now we have four cents. Um, uh, is, uh, you know, I, I have a similar perspective and actually the other, the, the ad I might give to offer there is, um, well, you know, first I would say, you know, acknowledge that the pandemic has, has been impactful in, in significant ways for everyone. And we know that it's impacted marginalized communities, the black and, and brown communities in ways that um, we are still learning to understanding and that there's, so there's some things that we have to pay attention to there. Um, I also like to believe that there's always that, there's always some silver lining or something we can, we can get, we gain from something. Uh, and I think, you know, it has forced us to slow down as a world uh, and it has forced executives um, to pay attention to humanity and what their people need. Now, is everyone getting it? No. Uh, is there more work to do? Absolutely. You know, so I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm realistic as well. I'm also optimistic. Um, but, I, you know, I'm, I, I think there's something that hopefully this is going to give us. Uh, and I, I'm curious, as you're having those conversations with individuals or, you know, with leaders, what are you, how are you helping to, helping to encourage them on this journey? What are those conversations like of, leaning into humanity. Um, my guess is it's probably different as well if you're talking to a male leader or a, wo a woman leader, or you know, if you're talking to you know, an individual for themselves or for, if they're leading a company, I'm, I'm, how are you helping them sort of get there? I used to uh, filter myself. Um, and I stopped doing that about a year ago. And I started trusting myself around the, the humanity aspect. And so I, I just start riffing on a lot of the stuff we've been talking about today, the necessity of being human. I changed my vernacular a little bit. Um, and, and, you know, I, I educate about what healthy masculinity is. I educate about you know, having head and heart. I educate and share what we've been learning and, and creating these spaces on Friday calls where people are struggling. I'm inviting them not to do an end around on that, but to go straight at it. And the, a phrase that came up for me is, we need to tend to the business of being human before we can tend to business. Hmm. And that is what's friggin' present right now. And if you bypass that, you're missing the boat. And if you value your people and you take time and you maybe even share your own struggle, saying, this is hard. This sucks. I'm, I'm sad. What, whatever your, one's truth is, you give other people permission to do the same. It grounds people. It unites people. And then they can do their work. So when I start talking like that, I'm, I half expect them to hang up 
<laughs> and they're not. They're not. They're saying, what else can we do? What do you, what do you think, Ray? And I'm like, wow. <laughs> okay, keep talking. <laughs> keep going. <Being> human. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's very high level to answer your question. That's what I've been noticing. And that's fuel for me to keep bringing it, keep pushing it, pushing and pushing it, and, and, we'll, and then watch what happens. I'm, I'm curious, when, when you use the phrase, the business of being human, uh, and I don't, I, I, I guess I have a hypothesis, which is why I'm asking the question yeah. that, that uh, this may be based on my own bias, right? That a woman might be like, oh, I know what you're talking about. And a man might be like, what do you mean? <laughs> All right, so I have a fair amount of experience of either attempting to bifurcate my speech when there's men and women in the room. So I've tr chunked it up to being human. So here's what I mean by that. Um, in my new book, I, and, and, I came up with six heart-based leadership principles that apply to all human beings. One is emotional literacy. Two is vulnerability. Three is authenticity. Four is accountability. Five is inclusivity and six is love, right? So those principles as a leader, as a human, um, are anchor points for us to walk through life. And, and if, if we, you, I, everyone on the call chooses to adapt, bring more of those forward, there's lots of dividends going to come your way. Your, your connections will increase. Your leadership will, let I me mean, think about it. If I've asked a room full of people first, and, and, and this is what I do do with the men and the women, I'll say, hey, guys, watch this. And I'll say to the women in the room, uh, if I admit that I don't have an answer or that I'm afraid or I'm not sure versus I got this, do you trust me more or less? I'll show of hands if you trust me more. And most of the hands go up in the room. I'm like, guys, see that? I just told the truth. It wasn't like I got this, I have all the answers, but I was human, right? So one of my messages is, you know, vulnerability engenders trust. It creates connection. So as a leader, regardless of, you know, your gender or how you identify, um, is, is, very, is very, very important, right? So, you know, and I could, I could give you examples for all those heart-based leadership principles, but, you know, a lot of my work has been focused on getting men caught up. Mm -hmm. and, doing away with the outdated playbook of what it means to be a man that largely falls on men to take responsibility for that. And there's some responsibility for women that have contributed to the old model. So we all need to like throw that book away and be in a conscious rewrite, which is, well, you know, this year's theme for the better man conference is it's all about him, healthy, inclusive masculinity. And we're going to, um, uh, I'm envisioning a, a, a collaborative rewrite of what that healthy masculinity looks like for everybody, not just men, not just white men, right? So I could go on and on and on and on. <laughs> well, you, you're, you're now reminding me of the Gillette commercial of uh, what, uh, what masculinity is, oh, yeah. a, a rewrite of masculinity. Um, maybe, we, maybe we can find that and put it in the chat. Um, Liz is like, Brian, I heard. I'm so grateful for Liz because it, it helps it helps allow me to sustain in the conversation. Um, I want to ask, you, you've mentioned a couple of things that you're doing. Um, and uh, so Fridays, tell us about Fridays again. Like what is, is it every Friday? What is it? Is it a series? So, so people, yeah. So the, the story behind uh, the Friday calls was day one of shelter in place. I saw um, a bunch of long faces on my partner's call and I said, can we get, and I'll, I'll spare the expletive friggin' real and, and do a real check-in because on, on all of our calls, we check in and we, we reveal, we say today I'm feeling sad or I'm afraid or, or something's got my attention or whatever the case may be. It brings us together. And that day on shelter in place, um, everyone had a bomb to drop. 
And the idea occurred to me, we need to create this space for leaders to do that so they can be present for their people. So I reached out to a couple of people. Next thing I know, we're doing Getting Real in Times of Crisis series using one of those heart-based leadership principles a week, uh, uh, bringing a guest on, and then putting people into breakout rooms, three, four, five, six people, and saying, here's a question we want you to answer. They connect with other people, they get real, we, they come back. What was that like for you? Put it in the chat or raise your hand. And it was an engage, it is an engagement model, model that helps people be human. And it caught like wildfire. And next thing you know, we did a how white people, white allies can show up to combat racism. That was our most attended call. And so we, and then there was Pride Month and we had two different, uh, two different sessions there. And so between now and the conferences, we're gonna be doing them every other Friday. Uh, and they can, and by, based on the link that's in the chat, they can see what those are. They can sign up for them, uh, share the links, encourage them to come. And so um, it, we, from an, the idea was just an idea until we, we implemented it and people loved it. So that's, we're going to emulate that engagement experience at our virtual Better Man conferences as well. So you're, so you are going, I was, that was my next question is, well, how often do you do the, the beverage, the, the, sorry, the beverage man conferences, the better man, I, and apparently I'm thirsty. Uh, how do you, how often do you do the better man conferences? Are you going virtual this year? Yeah. How do people do so at the beginning of the year? We were going to do London and it was going to be hosted by Moody's and city and New York and San Francisco. And then COVID kind of blew everything up, but now we're doing a Pacific time an Eastern time and a Greenwich time conference, September 17th for Pacific time. And this is all on the website. Uh, October 8th for Eastern time, and I believe October 29th for uh, for Greenwich time. So, and we're you know we're looking for sponsors uh, and people to attend for you know all three conferences. We're finding that because people don't have to travel, it's a lot easier. So you know we're going to be cognizant of Zoom fatigue, fatigue, create a very interactive experience. Eduardo Placer, who you've had on the call, is going to be our illustrious host again. I can't wait. He, he just makes me laugh and warms my heart when he is Eduardo. So I'm looking forward to him um, bringing his overlay to the conference. Eduardo so, is just a joy. Yeah, he is. Yeah. That, well, that, and actually, I met Eduardo the same day I met you at the Better Man Conference at Moody's this past fall. Yeah. So, um, and then I'm like, I have to know him. He's just, he's just a light and a joy and a good, a good spirit. Um, so, uh, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to those conferences, uh, this fall. That's, that's, ex that, and, and I would encourage anyone who's, who's watching or listening, please, uh, you know, check those out. I, um, it was a powerful day. And I think for me, the thing that was most powerful that day was, um, and again, this, we, we've talked about this, so, so the statement won't be surprising, although it was the other side of the coin of, I'm so used to being in rooms that we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I don't see men there. So I just, I got used to that. Um, and uh, and now um, I'm like, and that day I'm like, I got to see men like in the room and they're part of the conversation. And that was super exciting. And they were being real. I mean, I can't tell you how many diversity and inclusion professors came up to me like, I can't believe this, Ray. These men are being real, they're emoting, they're telling the truth, this is awesome. And that, you know, so, you know, that's, that comes from years of knowing how to create the space for men to do that. I love that. I love that. Well, I know we're, we're are just about out of time. So I'm going to put up the slides again and just mention um, a friend of both of ours who is going to be with me, uh, joining me next week, uh, Katie Mooney. Um, I see Liz is a fan. I know, I know, I'm sure Ray, you're a fan as well. Katie. Yeah. We all love Katie. Uh, and it's our final episode of the Hope Heart Human Spirit series. So I hope you'll join us next week. We'll be back at the regular time at 3 p.m. Eastern time next Wednesday. Uh, so please join us. Um, Ray, I'll, I'll leave with just two um, questions for you to, to answer. One is how do people reach you if they want to get in touch? And what brings you joy? So if they go to bettermanconference.com and subscribe on our newsletter, um, that's one way to be uh, in the know because we, we send out blogs that I write, some of my partners that I write. And if they want to email me, ray at bettermanconference.com. 
Um, what brings me joy? Uh, the bicycle brings me joy because it brings me uh, freedom and release. But more than anything else, uh, sitting around the table with friends and family and where soul food and real food are, are, um, are enjoyed. That's, that's it for me. And that's, that's, you know, I, I, what I can do on the weekends with family, I want to do in the workplace. I love that. I love that. Ray, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it was a pleasure. Liz, as always, thank you for being with us. Um, your beautiful smile. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Love this conversation, Ray. Thank you, Brian and Liz and everybody else who was out there. I hope you, you got some nuggets to take away and next time. Absolutely. Again, for all of you joining, thank you for, for being with us. Uh, I wish you well and be kind to each other. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia.